this is about two or three in the afternoon and the, it's just me and Hervé in the restaurant, the photographer's taken his stuff and left. I'm packing my stuff away and out of the corner of my eye, I saw some rapid movement and I tur turned up to see Hervé standing two feet from me and he had a knife at my throat and he said, I've told you all the bullshit stories. Do you want to hear the real story of my life? And I was just like, I'm literally about to be stabbed to death by the dwarf from Fantasy Island. I'm willing to take responsibility for the shit that I've done. But you, no way, not even now, not even years fucking later. What a sad, pathetic little freak you are. What? You still think I'm the one that fuck everything up? Look at you, look at you. 32 days sober. And now what is it? What is it? Two hours? Huh? Oh, you feel like a drink now? You know, if someone had shown me a picture of Harvey Milchage, I would have been like, all oh, right, he's a guy from Mammoth Road and and I think he was on a TV show. That would have been it, and I wouldn't have known anything beyond that. Um, so it was a real sort of learning experience for me, this from reading the script to then going on this insane journey with <laughs> Sasha and Peter. Hervey probably knew that he was going to end his life, and he probably made that choice and decided to include this random British journalist who he knew nothing of and sort of trust him in a way with, with dealing with what he leaves behind and, and showing that legacy or whatever. I mean, that, I, and I was wondering, I wonder what would have happened, I wonder what was in her base head had you had you yeah. not interviewed him? I mean, would he have killed himself and there hadn't been an interview for years and it would have just been forgotten about, you know, it's, I, I, I was thinking about that earlier. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, as it was going on over our three meetings, and again, the film takes place over one, one night, but it really was three meetings over about five or six days. I knew something was going on. It was hard to really put my finger on it. Um, it was only when I got the call from his girlfriend, Kathy, to say that Hervé had killed himself that morning. It, it, when I had that news from her, you know, I just felt, I just started crying actually because it all, I couldn't work out what was going on until then. And then it suddenly made sense. And I realized that in effect, I was his suicide note. Were you surprised? They didn't used to send the juniors. I'm not a junior. Oh, only a junior would have written the story before they got here. Knick-knack. Tattoo. Just a silly little moment, but I'm sure that's all someone of your stature would be interested in. <laughs> that's funny. So the second time I met was just down the hill at Le Petit Chateau. This is exactly the fucking same as 25 years ago. This is fucking trippy, man, because I have not been here for 25 years. I don't think anyone's been here for 25 years. <laughs> I mean, literally, there is no difference. These, I remember these lights. I remember this thing, this turret. I mean, there's no difference to what it was like in 1993. The table was here, and there was absolutely no one at all in the restaurant. And I got here about 10, 15 at night. And he had all these dishes of food. So he had a duck à l'orange, he had a steak, he had chicken, and he had this little knife. And he was like taking little kind of bits of it. And I said, well, why are you doing that? And he said, well, my doctors have told me that the food's too rich. If I ate one of these whole dishes, it could be really bad for my health. So then he ate like little pieces of 12 dishes, which is just weird. What? What? That's it? No more questions? Got more than enough. Actually, I have another interview to get to tonight. Another interview tonight? Unfortunately, yeah. Well, Hervé paid the bill. He had this, you know, yeah. Hervé had no money. And yet when he showed up, he had this white limo, like it was a tattered yeah. limo, but he had a big roll of bills. And he was sort of throwing it around like it was like 1979. And I know he had no money because when I found out where he was living, so for whatever reason, he just had got the cash. And he, he, was, he probably yeah. knew that he was gonna himself and he you know yeah that's probably all he had or he, he cashed in something to he make cashed it in something like he but he had, had a big roll of money and he was just like had this and tipping the waiter a hundred dollars i mean i was like he was putting on a show i feel like i know this sounds strange but i actually feel like herve is somewhere here with us mm. laughing his head off like this is so ridiculous and funny are you out of your mind scared he said he wanted to give me a tour of LA, and one of the places he brought me is right here. This is on the second night, the second night that we met, which is called the Universal City Overlook. Are we getting out or? Yeah, okay. And I remember sit, actually sitting here, 
listening to him talk, listening to how they talk. And um, it was just one of these things where it was going on and you weren't quite sure what was happening, but he was so compelling and fascinating, you just wanted to stay with him. Well, I felt a lot of, you know, sort of personal um, parallels, uh, not, in, not maybe in all the major themes of Danny, but as much as I can make that my own, the better. But you're still acutely aware that you are playing a version of the fucking director who's with you <laughs> for every second of the shoot, you know. Actually, Jamie and Peter play the scene here. Camera's pointing that way. And as you can see in the background is the Universal Sheraton, which is really the site of my very last meeting with Hervé. And I guess we'll go there a little bit later. It's really a, a kind of, in a strange way, a kind of buddy picture <laughs> between two people who meet in extreme and unusual circumstances who start off hating each other and then by the end recognize that they're going through similar things. He must have known something because, you know, here we are 25 years later, <laughs> the film's been made. And so I kept the promise I made to him. Do you want to know where it really happened? In real life, what happened was I went up in the elevator and the doors opened, it was pitch black in the corridor. And I was like, something's happened. And I looked to the right and I saw a glint of light. And the lights came on and Hervé was standing by the light switch holding a, what I thought was like a giant calculator or something. I didn't know what it was. And I said, what's that? And he said, a stun gun. I said, why? In he said, in case. And I said, in case of what? There was no one around. Anyway, so we rode down in the elevator together, in this elevator. And we came to about, sort of around about here, and Hervé turned, and he grabbed me by the sleeve, and he said to me, tell them I regret nothing. And then he turned and he walked down the hall. The place where we actually shot it is very similar to what it was like at that time. Let's go downstairs. And we sort of lined up all the chandeliers so we could get the final shot. And this carpet, this decor, this whole vibe was exactly what it was like upstairs in 1993. <laughs> And that would be a story. <laughs> yeah, it certainly would.